so nice to have you here. Nice to be here, thank you very much. So, in the most expensive building in London, <laughs> but lovely. Mike Bloomberg knows how to do it. <laughs> so, you wrote a book, which I highly recommend that you read. Great title, The Virgin Banker. You wrote a book about making your way through the world of finance. Ernst & Young, Norwich Union, RBS Virgin Money, doing it in what is still very largely a man's world. I have nothing wrong with men. I like them. Um, but it still can be difficult for a woman going through. They still dominate the senior positions, often in the world's financial firms. How hard was it making your way through it all? and building your businesses. I mean, I've never, I don't know about anybody else here, I, I never think of myself as being a woman, if you know what I mean, just somebody that gets on with doing stuff in business. Uh, and I think that that's, that's really important. Um, so from my point of view, uh, I guess I had, like all of us, uh, we need support, don't we, in our lives. And you know, the lady here's talking about setting up a business. I mean, it's almost impossible to do that without support from friends and family, I think. Um, you know, you have to have some self-determination, but certainly from my point of view, you know, my husband was prepared to give up work so that I could carry on. My parents helped bring up my child, um, and uh, I don't think we can do it on our own, whether we're male or female. So, uh, as I say, I think you just get on with it. Well, I want to also ask you about um, what kept you focused and energized in your goals in building these businesses. I mean, there were some tough times. The financial sector coming off the crisis, this wasn't always easy. So how do you do it? Because I think about the CEOs and the executives who are out here in the audience, and we're all faced with obstacles constantly. That's part of running a business. Yeah, I mean, I think um, from my point of view, I never, ever think about running a business just to make profit. For me, that's a very limiting thing. Um, and for, um, I remember a long, long time ago that I realized that people don't get out of bed in the mornings to fill in a form, answer the phone, answer their emails or whatever do their Excel spreadsheets. Most people want to get out of bed to make a difference. And I think, you know, when we all start a new business or start a new job, everybody's excited, as I say, right. about the difference that they can make. And I think for me and for us, making that difference was the constant driver. And uh, we wanted to be able to do um, bigger and different things than just, if you like, running Virgin Money, and realize that you have to earn the right to do that. So if, I'm not suggesting that all you do is have a purpose and don't worry about your bottom line, but focusing on the bottom line in order to achieve a different thing, which for us was an intention to make everyone better off, really drove the business forward. Is it easy to do that or easier to do that when you've got someone like Richard Branson behind you who does do things differently? Like, what was the role of him and working with him? Um, I mean, I think that's it's a really good point because, of course, um, the whole virgin ethos is to challenge the establishment and to do things differently. Right. Um, and I think that um, we were able to really embrace that. But I, I passionately believe that, you, of course, that we all need people that uh, give us permission, if you like, to behave in certain ways. But we give ourselves permission. I think we lock ourselves into perceived boundaries in a way that we don't need to. And every time, whether, you know, I'm sort of in my 50s now, but in my early 30s, I was given a big project to handle back at Norwich Union, which is now Aviva. And we could only do it if we pushed out the boundaries. And, you know, this was a business that was closed down by the regulators, and I needed to bring together a lot of people to go all around the country to give a difficult message. And I remember asking a whole variety of people, by the way, your point here about making connections, for me, I think connections and networks are super important. You talk about that and a lot in your book, because you pull important. on people that you've known throughout your it's life to come back. In writing the book, I realized how important networks and connections <laughs> have been for me. And I'd made these connections back at Norajuna, and I was able to ask nearly, I don't know, 70 people, I think it was, to go out all over the country. And the thing that was so interesting was I couldn't tell them why, and they all turned up with suitcases packed, including swimsuits, because some of them thought they'd won a holiday. <laughs> and I just thought the optimism <laughs> involved with that. And, and they hadn't won a holiday. <laughs> they hadn't, I'm afraid, won a holiday. But they still went joyfully to go and try and make this difference. I thought it was interesting, too, you write about with Richard Branson. You say that he used to say, I guess you'd go to him to ask something, and he'd say, well, the answer is yes. Now, what was the question? Yep. Like, that's an interesting way of approaching everything. Well, and, and that has definitely rubbed off on me, and my team would say that can be a real pain, because what I find is that the thing I say to my daughter, who's 16, is I don't really mind what you do, but always take your opportunities. And that was a lesson that came home to me a very long time ago when I would qualify, well, struggled to qualify as an accountant. Went to Norwich Union um, as an accountant for a small part of the business that wasn't doing terribly well. Yeah. 
uh, complained to my boss about the fact the business wasn't doing terribly well, and he said, well, go to the sales and marketing team then and sort it out. And I thought, oh, God, I'm not a sales and marketing person. Um, but I took the job, and uh, it was brilliant. And a friend of mine, who was much better qualified to do it, had said no. And even today, 25 years on, when we get together for a drink, every time, I promise you, Sally says to me, wish I'd taken that opportunity. <laughs> and I think that's what Richard huh. means. The answer is yes. What was the question? You know, if you've got an opportunity, grab it with both hands and, and see where it goes. And it's interesting for me now, you know, as you rightly say, I uh, sold Virgin Money uh, to the Clydesdale Bank. The deal completed a month ago. And so for me at the moment, um, it is a really, it's, it's, it's almost different. like the world that we live in, you know, it's uncertain, unknown, very different, um, away from the people that I'm used to working with, but lots of random opportunities have, have come in. And as I say, my poor um, uh, assistant who has come over with me, is, we both said, gosh, we thought it'd be quieter after we left Virgin Money, but it's actually busier because we're taking all of the opportunities. And we like coming here, thank you for asking me. Well, you thank know, you for coming. Why, why would you say no? Right. So I think for everybody, I'd say any opportunity you get, take it, try and make it positive. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but at least you won't regret it. And it might open fabulous new doors. And I've always found that to be the case. What do you have to lose? Potentially. Um, I want to get into a little bit some of the issues because I know this, this we wanted to talk a bunch about talent. And you have been very outspoken about women in the workplace, women in finance, about parity and equality. Uh, I read something, an interview you did after that undercover investigation that exposed sexual harassment at that male only, male only excuse me, London charity dinner that was, I think, earlier this year. And you said, I was shocked. My team was shocked, the entire city was shocked. We all thought this was behind us, but there it is lurking in the shadows. It's a return to the sleazy 1970s. Um, why is this still happening? Um, I, well, And that's maybe an extreme, but I think about there's still not parity. Um, well, so uh, the reason that I, as you say, I've become outspoken on this particular um, subject is um, not, again, it was taking my opportunities, I suppose. I had never, ever wanted to be a sort of spokesperson for women's rights or whatever. And you don't call yourself a feminist, from what I understand. No, well, although feminists tell me I ought to, because what I mean is I think everyone should be treated absolutely equally, right? This isn't about women instead of men. This is about it doesn't matter if it's male or female, if you're male or female, what your sexuality is, what your ethnicity is. We should all be treated equally and have equal inclusion. opportunity. Always about inclusion. And um, I uh, happened to be at the Mansion House speech. Or, uh, it was June 2015. And um, completely by surprise, and didn't know why at that point, found myself sat next to George Osborne at that dinner. Um, and we were talking about this sort of thing, and what I hadn't understood at all was that financial services is actually the worst sector of all industrial sectors in the UK for inclusion of women. And I thought, I can't, I'm astonished at that because this is my own sector, mm -hmm. so I ought to try and get to the bottom of why that's the case. And um, so he asked me to do a piece of work to look at why that's the case, and it was clearly true that it's nothing to do, of course, with women having babies or being mothers or whatever. When we asked women why they didn't progress in financial services, motherhood was one of the lowest reasons. Uh, it was all to do with culture. And I think, to your point, why does this still happen? I think in organisations where the culture hasn't changed, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we continue to get some of the behaviours that we haven't liked. But the really positive and optimistic point, I think, is that because of the light that's been shone on these sort of issues, cultures are changing in all organisations. And, you know, we are the people in this room that can make that happen. And the conversations are certainly making it known, right, so that things change. But you do talk about diversity and inclusion, that it's important for productivity at a company. Right? This isn't just about maybe doing the right thing. I mean, there's been countless studies about you improve diversity at a company and you improve the top and bottom lines. You put more, have a more diverse corporate board, right? I mean, this is, this is just dollars and common sense, well, and financial sense. I mean, it is interesting because when I first started to do this work, a number of white men quite aggressively said to me, you're taking our jobs away and my son's jobs away. And of course, the point isn't that at all. There's a real correlation between the fact that the UK has got 
one of the lowest productivity measures in the G, whatever we are, um, and also the least diversity. Because this isn't about women taking men's jobs, it's about more jobs being created that include women too, and then we'll start to improve productivity. Now, I'm sorry to say this, because I, I don't normally have these arty-farty sort of thoughts, but as I, look, as I sat in this corner here and looked at the wall behind us, I thought, isn't that unusual in a, you know, a conference centre like this? And, and it just struck me that this, for me, is a little bit of a sort of um, example of diversity. Do you know what I mean? In the olden days, these, this sort of room would be built properly square, wouldn't it, with everything being the same? And this is a structure that's similar. It's held up. It looks beautiful. But the, the pillars, if you like, are all different shapes and sizes, as far as I can tell. And for me, it's quite a good example of diversity, that actually we can create something that holds the structure together, but is more beautiful, more productive, and something that creates a better environment when you've got diversity. So how did you, at Virgin Money, ensure that you had a diverse talent pool at the company? What did um, you do? What were the strategies that you implemented? I mean, and it, and uh, certainly we didn't, by the time I left a month ago, we hadn't cracked it. Um, because uh, we acquired Northern Rock back in 2012. And, you know, so although the Virgin Money was set up as a new business, we'd acquired a business that had been around for more, more than 100 right, years. Right. And I think in some of the bigger, older businesses, inevitably some of the systems and structures and people have obviously, you know, are sort of built in a, in a more traditional way. Um, and what you can't do, and, and some people definitely can't get their heads around this, of course you can't just start firing people because they're male, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Um, but what you can do is create a different structure. So my finance team, for example, was, I remember having a breakfast with the finance team, and, and it, it, it's interesting that you see names on a piece of paper and you can sort of rationalise why the diverse mix isn't as good as you want. When you go into a room with people and just see white men or white women or whatever it is, you realise that groupthink properly exists. Um, and I said to my uh, CFO at the time, who was rightly saying, well, I can't fire everybody. Well, why don't we change the structure then? You know, why don't we put a chief of staff in and, and move people around so that we can actually create a different, um, a different way of doing business, not just this existing structure, but forcing women or different types of people into the same old structure. And I think that and you really did. helped. That really helped when we realized that actually you can change structure as well as content, if you see what I mean. And then, you know, specifically, we always um, asked for a balanced um, candidate list from headhunters. And I do think that makes a huge difference. You know, I, I've never, I, I never think you should do anything other than have the right person for the job, male, female, black, white, or whatever. Um, but I do think that you should have a list to choose from that enables you to have, make the right choices, if you see what I mean. Right. So we would always insist from headhunters that we got a balanced and diverse list of, of candidates. So that you were starting with a diverse list. And then the really important thing is to measure it properly. And so um, I think that sometimes diversity can be seen as an HR issue. And for me, it's absolutely a business issue. And um, That's a good... Say that again. People think that, uh, that diversity is an HR issue when actually it's a business issue. And in running our businesses, I suggest that you know, we all um, you know, probably pour over the numbers of our commercial successes and our cost bases, etc. I think you have to pour over the numbers from a diversity point of view and work out which parts of your business are good and bad and who's doing good things and who's not um, and really make that an objective to achieve in the same way that you achieve you know, your bottom line and your other commercial objectives. I want to ask our, our, our group here a couple of questions and then and you can um, get your thoughts on that as well. I want to ask you guys a polling question. Uh, when it comes to talent, I want to find out some of the challenges that you are facing. So what is, pull out your phones, what's your biggest challenge with regard to talent? Finding qualified candidates, retaining top talent, lack of diversity among candidates, and retraining, reskilling your existing workforce. Let's just see what we get here. Because I'm curious, as you were, Jane Ann, if you look at some of these choices, as you were running your companies, did you face all these problems? Was one in particular the toughest? Looks like finding qualified candidates, which is what I hear certainly back in the States big time, like finding workers. But retaining is also tough. And if you lose workers, good workers, it costs a company. It's expensive. I mean, I think, um, and again, you know, I, I understand the nuances around what I'm about to say, so I'll say it more extremely for impact. <laughs> but I Lack think of it, diversity, too. I, I think you have to take a risk on people. 
And so, you know, from my point of view, I was uh, 32 when um, we set up Virgin, what is now Virgin Money, it was called Virgin Direct then. And I got no experience of setting up a business at all. The experience that I had got was uh, I'd worked in Norwich Union and I'd seen some stuff go wrong. And Richard, uh, Richard Branson actually said to me and to the financial regulators, because don't forget, you know, when we set up fi Virgin in financial services, uh, Branson had only been known for travel and records. Yeah. And so the financial services regulator said, why on earth should we trust this man <laughs> to set up something as important as a financial services company? And Richard said, well, look, put it this way, uh, people wouldn't get on my aeroplanes if they thought they wouldn't get off the other end. There was no more regulated business than aeroplanes. Right. And so the regulators listened and then, you know, um, were prepared to give us the opportunity to prove what we said, but we were not experienced really in financial services. When we bought Northern Rock, you know, I wasn't a banker. I'd done insurance and asset management. And um, because we were preparing ourselves to listen to the customer and develop the business rather than do the skilled thing, I think we were able to be a little bit more innovative. And so I don't think you should find, we, any of us, should find necessarily always square pegs for square holes. I think, you know, give people with the right attitude and opportunity. And I've always recruited for attitude first. Good it's people can do good things. Completely, I'm sure that's right. I have another question I'm gonna ask uh, the group here. There's lots of men in this room. It's an, it is a diverse audience, but there's lots of men. Um, and I'm curious, what's the most important thing men can do to encourage gender equality in the workplace? We'll bring up that polling question. So the options are, make work-life balance a priority for everybody at the company, which plays to your idea of inclusion, mentoring, sponsoring for women, quotas, or compensation transparency. And I'm curious what you think about that in your experience, Jane Ann, as we watch the mentoring, sponsoring. And, and my understanding of mentoring is you kind of help somebody along. Sponsoring means you say, hey, you, you're great. We've got a job for you. I'm going to work you, you know, help you get through the pipeline here. I mean, I, I completely agree that with the mentoring sponsoring point, and I've got t two little stories to, to tell about that, and the, the, the summary being that it needs powerful men to change things, right, committed to this agenda. Uh, and my two stories are that um, f the first one was that uh, when I was doing the work for George Osborne on women in finance, I was ringing, back to networks really, ringing around the city before the report was published to try and make sure that I'd got things right and I'd got support from some of the powerful people. And the day I was supposed to be talking to Mark Carney, sadly my mother died, and so obviously I couldn't speak with him, and he'd heard that was the reason that I couldn't uh, speak with him. So he rang me a few days later and said, I'm really sorry to hear about your mum, obviously I can't help with that, but how can I help with this report? And I said to him, well, could we launch it in the court of the Bank of England? And mm. he said, yeah, of course, that's no problem at all. Well, of course, when you've got the governor asking the city into the court of the Bank of England to hear about the importance of diversity, people properly have to listen, much more so than if I'd just invited people down the pub sort of thing. Um, and what I didn't know was that as we launched the report, he gave a speech. Now, that set the tone properly for this report. And uh, it's very interesting. I mean, he's a father of uh, four daughters, I think. Yeah. And I think you find genuinely that men with daughters do tend to take this agenda much more seriously. The second example is, and I, I've never told the name of this person, I won't. I'm a Man United fan, sorry for those that don't like Man United. <laughs> and um, I, uh, Man United do a business conference every year, and, which is excellent, actually. I was invited up last year, and uh, we were all in some hotel in Manchester. In being put in a coach to go to Old Trafford for this day away. And there was a seat next to a, quite a famous uh, FTSE 100 CEO, a man, who had not signed up to our Women in Finance Charter. And of course, I went to sit next to him, and you can imagine, he, I could see him thinking, oh, God, the last person I want to sit next to is this woman. And I said to him, you know, why haven't you signed up to the Charter? And he said, because there aren't enough good women. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. So we had a little discussion around this. And, um, it's not we, getting we, off that bus. <laughs> but interestingly, so we got to Old Trafford, and uh, a bit like this morning, I guess, I was the first person that had been asked to speak, and I'd been asked to speak about diversity. And throughout the rest of the day, there were male speakers, one of whom was Sir Alex Ferguson. There was a general from the American Army. Um, the guy that runs UPS, and for whatever reason, they all weaved diversity. I mean, Ferguson was talking about diversity in football teams, right? They all weaved it into right. their conversations and the importance of it. And at the end of the day, this guy said to me, oh, we ought to talk about signing up to that charter, and, in, and indeed they did. And it made me realize it's all very well for me to bang on about this, but actually the most important thing is for the 
people that appear to have the most to lose to do it. So powerful men, you can help this agenda at least as much as, um, as women and other minority groups. I'd love to open up to questions. Forgive me, I didn't mean to go so long. Because <laughs> she's so great. Um, please, back there. And I maybe... want to see this mic thrown. I have to, oh, not that oh. one, probably. No. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah. Excellent. That's good. <laughs> uh, I, I think that. What's your name? Uh, Michael James, sorry, I'm CEO of Ventura International, an online anti piracy company. Um, and I think what you've talked about is very important in business, but I do think that's sort of like half the battle. And being an engineering company, um, I think there's a lot to be done at sort of like a school level. Yeah, yeah. And I think, or, or even before that as well. And so do you think there's any way that sort of like business can help influence at that particular stage or kind of encourage more going on within schools or even before school, sort of like primary schools or anything like that? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I'd say, uh, sorry, you can probably do that. You know what I mean? The, the more of us that go and talk to school children, I think, about what they can do and, what, and you know, the path that they can take to get there, the better. Because I, I personally, th personally, and I know everybody doesn't feel like this, that for me, principle rather than process is important. So inspiring kids rather than just train, educating them, I think, is so important. But, I mean, to your point, um, I mean, I th you're right that this whole issue has got so much more complexity around it. And, and, the, and you know, I talked to the government around, in particular financial services, you know, the need for financial education and the need to train children for the new world that's ahead of us. And what I can say is all the politicians that I've spoken to, they definitely get it. It's just such an enormous complex task but I also get you know people tend to talk to me about women in finance and say well what about all sorts of other diversity and and what I've felt in the work that I do at least is you've got to start somewhere and so I completely agree that the somewhere needs to broaden out and I'd encourage everybody to get involved in the breadth but if we don't start somewhere we'll end up nowhere I think it's a great great point please back there and just let us know who you are. Oh. Angela Mortal of PLC. Um, I'm really interested to know where banking is going to go. Because at <laughs> the moment, they're in, a, they're in a really interesting place where they're sort of caught halfway between the high street, yeah. uh, where they're screwing that up, and halfway between the technology. And I'm not sure that's yet happening. I'm quite interested in your views on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think it's a really good question, and and indeed has a. I don't even know if it's the right answer, but my answer will be quite complicated at this point. I mean, I, I think that um, in my experience, what we found at Virgin Money is that although customers do want to be able to deal with their bank online and digitally, they still want to trust people because money is an emotional thing rather than just a practical thing. Uh, we had a, you know, at Virgin Money, we had 75 branches, so not too many, but they were all busy. You know, we had millions of people come through the door, and I, and I think that, frankly, I've said it publicly, you know, the likes of RBS that keep on shutting branches, particularly where they're shutting branches in Scotland, I think it'll come back and bite, because I don't think it costs that much. They can afford it, and actually the consequence on the local community of those closures is huge. So I, I think working out the balance between human relationships and um, sort of the, the, the practicality of transactional banking is, is really important. Um, the, the fact is that the smaller banks, um, I, I talk about fintech a, a, a bit, and, and the problem in many ways is that fintech tends to be built for tech and there aren't, isn't much fin in it. And, and banking is complicated. And the reason that you get financial crises is that people drop the complicated stuff, if you see what I mean. And so I think we have to help the smaller businesses that are doing the innovative things to also do, the thing, do things right. In the end, I fear that that could mean <laughs> that the big banks continue to dominate because I think they ha you know, they've got the money to put into the technology. They understand how to do financial stuff. If they can build, rebuild trust with the consumer, then I think they can continue to be very successful. Um, but that's a huge if. Trust is the huge if. Maybe one last question? <clears throat> I will try to. <laughs> oh, hi, I'm, I'm Nawaz Imam, I'm the CEO of a small uh, capital markets fintech company here in London. Um, but you mentioned that um, measuring you know, outcomes is very, very important, along with putting the right structures in place. Can you just give us more of a sort of a practical flavor of the things that you did measure? Well, I mean, one really simple answer is that, you know, being a financial services company, you'll know that um, people, 
a lot of remuneration is, is bonus, if you see what I mean. And I remember as I started to look at uh, the gender um, fairness in Virgin Money, I was looking at how did my team and their team allocate bonus, and I was horrified given the purpose that we set ourselves and the fact that we were, as we are as a senior management team, quite gender balanced, that actually the initial allocation of bonus was hugely skewed to men rather than women. And, and part of the reason for that is consistent across financial services everywhere, apparently, and is a cultural point to do with the different behaviours that tend to happen between men and women, which is where broadly, I mean, of course, this isn't, ex this isn't individually true, but broadly people say, Men are more likely to go and bang the table and say, I, re I did really well last year, I deserve a bonus, please pay me. And women are much more likely to say, look, you can see how well I did last year, I don't need to bang the table, just pay me properly. And what weak managers do is they tend to respond to the people that bang the table, which sometimes tend to be men, right? And that's why you get this skew, which means that women don't like financial services culture. And much to my astonishment in Virgin Money, that when I could actually see this before we paid it, I could see the skew, and when we and we did it through normal distribution, distribu normal distribution curves across different departments, if you like. And of course, as soon as I played that back to my team and their teams, they were equally horrified. And I think if we hadn't actually measured that and looked at the distributions across those populations, we would never have known. Um, and when I pushed it back to people and said, "You need to think about this in a more balanced way," it wasn't actually that hard for people for them to. To, to write that wrong, but without seeing those curves, they would never have got So there. they didn't really realise it? They didn't realise it because they weren't measuring it. They just thought, well, you know, um, I don't know, jo John's obviously done a good job and he's come and told me he has and I've, I sort of agree with him and he's been quite in my face about right. it. And, you know, Sarah, I, I haven't thought about her too much because she's, also just, did done, a good job, she's but just done a good job in the background, but actually yeah. when I sit and think about it, maybe John and Sarah have done the similar, have contributed similarly, if you see what I mean. Yeah, one last question. Fernando, um, <clears throat> I'm a co-founder of a cybersecurity company. Um, so what I find is quite difficult is to find women in tech. Yeah, very, very difficult. Um, mm. The Chinese recently put, you know, several billions into the educational system to start to teach AI to 11-year-olds. Yeah, because they they know that a skills gap exists now and it's going to be even worse in the future. What can we do in this country and around? Europe to actually incentivize our governments to do the same? Yeah, I mean, I think, to be honest, uh, there are lots of things to criticize uh, Whitehall and Westminster for, but when you look at their own gender balance, it's good. Um, you know, so, and I do a bit of work there now, and I'm constantly impressed by how they've managed that. Um, I also think that, um, you know, if you look at the National Health Service, that balance there is good. I um, don't know about you, I notice it now for obvious reasons, I suppose. Um, I, I grew up in a generation where it was a surprise to see a female pilot. Well, I'm flown between Edinburgh and London often now by female pilots. And so, um, uh, a while back, when I did this Women in Finance report, to be honest, uh, I did a, a panel at number 11 Downing Street, and there was somebody there from Goldman Sachs, by the way, who had been very supportive of this agenda, so forgive, uh, they should forgive me for saying what I'm about to say. And the person there said, uh, look, we think we can get to gender equality across most of the business, but not in IT. And I said, well, why not IT? Well, you know what, it's, um, w women just don't do IT, women just don't do tech, right? And we passed on, and then somebody in the audience put their hand up and said, I'm sorry, I can't let that go. Why on earth can't women do IT? Um, and we concluded, you know, we've now got women in special forces, or at least being, you know, special forces opening themselves up to women. Um, so I think that we have to get rid of this view that IT, technology, tech and development is a man's thing. And we have to talk to women about it. People like you need to employ women for it. Because, you know, I know you're asking this positively, and I'm going to answer you slightly negatively. You can't, you know, organisations can't dismiss half of the population because that's where half of the brilliance lies. I haven't got an answer, but we have to find it together. We have to wrap up, but just quickly, in your book you talk about EBO, mm. everyone better off. I think it just plays to when you're thinking about, it plays in so many different ways, right, when building a business, but also yes. when you're building your workforce. Absolutely. Yeah, oh yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I mean, when uh, I set up uh, Virgin in Financial Services, I wanted to, with my colleagues to think about, you know, what, what is our purpose? 
and we realised that we wanted to do something more than just build a bank, right? We wanted to make everyone mm -hmm. better off. And what that's done, um, you know, what, what we say is, of course, we need to make a profit for our company, but we need to do good things for our communities. We need to make sure our staff can have good careers, etc., and look after our customers, etc. And what that did was um, it meant that we recruited people who understood and loved that purpose and journey. And the culture sort of pushed out people that didn't. And so as a consequence, we were able to create a team, I hope, that you know, went in a similar, in a constant direction. And that's been something to be proud of. I miss it. I will miss it. It's only four weeks. I still miss it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait to see what's next. Jane Ann, thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.